Welcome to Have History Real Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and for the past couple of weeks, I have been talking about Gettysburg from the Confederate perspective. In this video, I want to talk about the Union's viewpoint of Pickett's Charge, and I will read General Winfield Scott Hancock's report of Pickett's Charge. He is my favorite Union commander primarily for his actions at Gettysburg and later his actions during the Overland Campaign, which I will cover in the future. The Corps had been so weakened by its losses on the 2nd that on the 3rd instant it required every available man in the line of battle to cover the ground held the previous day. Colonel Carroll's brigade of General Hayes' division was retained by General Howard, and in the exception of the 8th Ohio, was not engaged with the 2nd Corps during the day. The early morning passed in comparative quiet along our front, but the heavy and continued firing on the right indicated that the efforts of the enemy were being directed on the 12th Corps. Trifling affairs occurred at intervals between the enemy skirmishers and our own, and the artillery of the Corps was frequently successfully engaged with that of the enemy. From 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. there was an ominous stillness. About 1 o'clock, apparently by a given signal, the enemy opened up on our front with the heaviest artillery fire I have ever known. The guns were in position at an average distance of about 1,400 yards from my line and ran in a semicircle from the town of Gettysburg to a point opposite Round Top Mountain. Their number is variously estimated at from 115 to 150. The air was filled with projectiles, there being scarcely an instant, but that several were seen bursting at once. No irregularity of ground afforded much protection, and the plain in rear of the line of battle was soon swept of everything movable. The infantry troops maintained their position with great steadiness, covering themselves as best they might by the temporary but trifling defenses they had erected and the accidents of the ground. Scarcely a straggler was seen, but all waited the end of the fierce cannonade. Knowing well what it had foreshadowed, the artillery of the quarry, imperfectly supplied with ammunition, replied to the enemy most gallantly, maintaining the unequal contest in a manner that reflected the highest honor on this arm of the service. Brown's battery, Battery B, 1st Rhode Island, which had suffered severely on the 2nd and expended all of its canister on that day, retired before the cannonading ceased, not being effective for further service. The remaining batteries continued their fire until only canister remained to them and then ceased. After an hour and 45 minutes, the fire of the enemy became less furious and immediately their infantry was seen in the woods beyond the Emmitsburg Road, preparing for the assault. A strong line of skirmishers soon advanced, followed by two deployed lines of battle, supported at different points by small columns of infantry. Their lines were formed with a precision and steadiness that extorted the admiration of the witnesses of that memorable scene. The left of the enemy extended slightly beyond the right of General Alexander Hayes' division, the right being about opposite the left of General Gibbons. Their line of battle thus covered a front of not more than two of the small and incomplete divisions of the Corps. The whole attacking force is estimated to have exceeded 15,000 men. No attempt was made to check the advance of the enemy until the first line had arrived within about 700 yards of our position, when a feeble fire of artillery was opened upon it. But with no material effect, and without delaying for a moment its determined advance, the column pressed on, moving within musketry range, without receiving immediately our fire. Our men evincing a striking disposition to withhold it until it could be delivered with deadly effect. Two regiments of Standard's Vermont Brigade of the 1st Corps, which had been posted in a little grove in front of and at the considerable angle with the main line, first opened with an oblique fire upon the right of the enemy's column which had the effect to make the troops on that flank double in a little toward their left. They still pressed on, however, without halting to return the fire. The rifled guns of our artillery, having fired away all their canister, were now withdrawn, or left on the ground inactive, to await the issue of the struggle between the opposing infantry. Arrived at between 200 and 300 yards, the troops of the enemy were met by a destructive fire from the divisions of Gibbon and Hayes, which they promptly returned and the fight at once became fierce and general. In front of Hayes' division, it was not a very long duration. Mowed down by canister from Woodruff's battery and by the fire from two regiments judiciously 
posted by General Hayes in his extreme front and right, and by the fire of different lines in their rear, the enemy broke in great disorder, leaving 15 colors and nearly 2,000 prisoners in the hands of, his, of this division. Those of the enemy's troops who did not fall into disorder in front of the 3rd Division were moved to the right and reinforced the line attacking Gibbon's division. Two regiments of the brigade, the 69th and 71st Pennsylvania, were behind a low stone wall and a slight breastwork hastily constructed by them. The remainder of the brigade being behind the crest some 60 paces to the rear and so disposed as to fire over the heads of those in front. When the enemy's line had nearly reached the stone wall led by General Armistead, the most of that part of Webb's brigade posted here abandoned their position, but fortunately did not retreat entirely. They were, by the personal bravery of General Webb and his officers, immediately formed behind the crest before referred to, which was occupied by the remnant of the brigade. Emboldened by seeing this indication of weakness, the enemy pushed forward more aggressively, numbers of them crossing over the breastwork abandoned by the troops. The fight here became very close and deadly. The enemy's battle flags were soon seen waving on the stone wall. Passing at this time, Colonel Davero, commanding the 19th Massachusetts Volunteers, anxious to be in the right place, applied to me for permission to move his regiment to the right and to the front, where the line had been broken. I granted it, and his regiment and the 42nd New York Volunteers on his right proceeded there at once. But the enemy having left Colonel Hall's front, as described before, this officer promptly moved his command by the right flank to still further reinforce the position of General Webb, and was immediately followed by Harrow's brigade. The movement was executed, but not without confusion, owing to many men leaving their ranks to fire at the enemy from the breastwork. The situation was now very peculiar. The men of all brigades had in some measure lost their regimental organization, but individually they were firm. The ambition of the individual commanders to promptly cover the point penetrated by the enemy, the smoke of battle, and the intensity of the close engagement caused this confusion. The point, however, was now covered. In regular formation, our line would have stood four ranks deep. The colors of the different regiments were now advanced, waving in defiance of the long line of battle flags presented by the enemy. The men pressed firmly after them, under the energetic commands and example of their officers, and after a few moments of desperate fighting, the enemy's troops were repulsed, threw down their arms, and sought safety in flight or by throwing themselves on the ground to escape our fire. The battle flags were ours, and the victory was won. Thank you all for watching. Hancock's account is detailed, and he writes in a way that reflects his many years in the military. It is straightforward, but at the same time descriptive. I have a Patreon page for those who are interested in supporting the channel that way. If you are unable to join Patreon, simply share the video and get the word out about the channel. I have also created a store on teespring.com with some cool designs for t-shirts. The links to the Patreon page, Teespring store, Twitter page, and Facebook page are all in the description below. Thank you all again. I'll see you next week.